while Britain modelled through on desperation, improvisation, and the odd dash of native or imported genius, Germany continued its quest for victory through the relentless pursuit of quality. The delirious successes of the Blitzkrieg had convinced Hitler that only the development of a master race of weapons would deliver the knockout blow he craved. For the Führer, only the biggest and best would do. An ideology embodied by a fearsome military machine unleashed on Allied forces during the Desert War in 1943. We knew what we were going to do, we knew what the enemy was, or we thought we knew what the enemy was and where it was. And we went in two troops up, my troop, which was four troop on the left, and three troop, led by a friend of mine, Alan Lott, on the right. Everything was going smoothly and we were trudging along quite happily when there was an enormous explosion on the right side and I saw Alan Lott's tank blown up and he blown out of the turret. A massive burn, he was terribly burnt. Well, before I had any time to do anything at all about it, my own tank was hit. It really didn't affect me all that much. What did affect me was seeing Alan Lott in his condition and that feeling of guilt that I'd survived and he hadn't. Um, in fact, I, I, I think I could say that I went back to my... Um, Bivy that night and had a thoroughly good cry. Peter Gudgeon's battalion had been unlucky. It had run up against one of the most advanced military weapons of the war, the Tiger I tank. Only one working model survives today, and it's the very same vehicle that killed Peter's friend 70 years ago. Tiger tank number 131. This was the most impressive tank I had ever seen. I couldn't believe it was so big and so powerful. I think the most impressive thing about it, apart from its sheer size, was the enormous gun. And that was an anti-aircraft gun, which they used in anti-tank role, and had a fantastically accurate and heavy shell. Our instinct as, as regimental soldiers at that time was we're not going to stand much of a chance against this sort of thing. The formidable Tiger was the result of a design competition initiated by Hitler between people's car designer Ferdinand Porsche and engineering firm Henschel. On this occasion, engineering muscle prevailed over design brilliance, and Henschel's design was unveiled on Hitler's birthday in 1942. The Tiger tank was a fearsome legend in its short life. It was a machine that was truly feared by its enemies. This heavily armored, muscular looking mechanical beast just terrified people. The psychological impact of this awesome weapon was integral to its design. Like the Stuka, the Volkswagen, and the Swastika, this was designed with a message as well as a mission. Hitler in the 1930s looks at the tank as having tremendous symbolic power. He sees this, this the tank as symbolizing the resurgence and the might of the new Nazi Germany. As a 60-ton piece of propaganda, the Tiger was a huge success. When Tiger 131 was captured in the Tunisian desert in 1943, the Tommies were awestruck, celebrating its capture as if it were an enemy general. Back in England, the army commissioned a full design report and called in an experienced tank commander, recently invalided out from the front line. 
I was amazed to find my old friend the Tigers had knocked me out, coming back for examination by me. So I entered that with, with great enthusiasm. I wanted to know what made it work. It is beautifully engineered all the way through. The sheer detailed design they put into it. The steering gear, the transmission, the gearbox, the suspension, all the torsion bars, the way they'd machined all the armor faces before they welded them together. Beautifully engineered, very solid job, but a waste of time. There was that tradition in German engineering and design where the most sophisticated was the best, and they just could not stop it. And the problem for the Germans was this, that they came up with these ideas for ever more powerful, ever more sophisticated tanks. But to do that, they required ever more time to think them through, ever more engineering skills, ever greater cost. At a cost of 250,000 Reichsmark, the Tiger was more than twice the price of any German tank to date. It boasted power steering, sophisticated transmission, even a fully illustrated owner's manual. But in the grinding war of attrition that had developed since Hitler's invasion of Russia, it was a luxury item. The design philosophy behind the Tiger is very much, let's have the best, most powerful vehicle. The downside of that design philosophy is the amount of resources the Tiger takes to make. Would you be better off building something in larger quantities that's a lot cheaper? Born from a completely different mindset to the Tiger, this is a Russian T-34 tank. These two weapons represent a clash in design philosophies, exemplified by a simple statistic. They only actually make 1,300 Tiger I tanks. As a comparison, the Russians make well over 60,000 T-34 tanks. They are coming out with these very crude but very effective vehicles in such quantity that whatever your quality, these T-34s are going to get you in the end. As Joe Stalin put it, quantity has a quality all its own. And the wartime production of T-34s proved him right. Vast factories relocated beyond the reach of the advancing Germans turned out T-34s by the thousand. At staggering speed, under brutal conditions. The spirit of the Gulag, fused with the technical know-how of the car-making capital of America, Detroit. In the late 1920s, Stalin realized that he needed to industrialize the Soviet Union. It was still essentially a pre-industrial society. They realized that the way to do that would be through the application of Fordism. So however bizarre it may sound, Soviet economic planners came to Detroit. And they enthusiastically imported these ideas back into the Soviet Union. To the extent that the architect Albert Kahn who designed all of Henry Ford's factories in Detroit, opened an office in the Soviet Union and designed something like 300 factories in the 1930s. Just three months after Tiger 131 had blitzed Peter Gudgeon's battalion in North Africa, German ground forces were swamped by thousands of T-34s at the Battle of Kursk. The largest tank battle of the war Kursk halted German advances on the Eastern Front for good. German design excellence rendered irrelevant by Soviet mass mobilization and American mass production. We shall produce 45,000 tanks 